Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, next session of the PML Reading Group. This week, we're going to be covering Chapter 10, Logistic Regression, and Antarip will be once again presenting the material. So um, let's uh, get started. Hi, Perry. Thank, thank you. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Hi, hello, everybody. So let's begin. Let me share my screen. Right. So today's topic is 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 where's my pen? Mouse pointer is pen. So today's topic is logistic regression, something you must have heard about. And if you have studied linear regression, so logistic regression comes along with it. So what exactly is logistic regression? So in linear regression, what did you do? Let's say you are to predict uh, temperature. So there, there are multiple parameters, parameter one, parameter two, parameter three, parameter four. And based on these four parameters, you predict the temperature of the day, what the temperature would be. It might be 10 degrees Celsius. It might be 30 degrees Celsius. It might be 45 degrees Celsius. It might be minus five degrees Celsius. Now I set a threshold of 25 degrees Celsius. I don't want such such specific details. No, I don't want such specific details. I just care about, just let me know what is the temperature. Is it high, is it hot or is it cold? And what would be the parameter? So how do you decide something is hot or something is cold? It is relative. It is a relative parameter. So you decide a threshold. So that threshold is 25 degrees Celsius. For instance, let's say you're doing an experiment and you decide a threshold to be 25 degrees Celsius. Anything above it is considered to be hot. Anything below it would be considered as cold. So what would be cold? This is cold. This is cold. This is hot. This is hot. What did we do? Just a moment before, we were taking parameter one to three, four, and predicting a numerical outcome, or we were doing linear regression. If you apply, if you go a bit ahead of linear regression and add a classification factor to it, that is logistic regression. So welcome to logistic regression. If you've understood this particular concept, you've understood logistic regression. You should be very, very comfortable with it. Now, let's remove this. So different, different, there are multiple names of logistic regression. They are also known as logits, maximum entropy. This is a very popular debate on the internet, but my, my take on this is it is a classifier and that is what it is. Two class or multi-class, ideally, theoretically, it is two class. What SKLearn provides is multi-class also. Also called a sigmoid function. A very, very, very brief overview. So this is, let's say this was, this is something we just discussed. This was your linear regression line. And what we do is decide a threshold. Any value lying um, in this region would be made to fall down here, down here or anything above here, the threshold will be made to, will be made up, uh, will make a projection of it on the y equal to one or y equal to zero, whatever the threshold is. So that is what logistic regression is. This is what logistic regression is. We will talk about this S, uh, shape or those kind of things, but this is a very, very brief introduction of logistic regression. So turning linear regression into logistic regression, that is the very, very superficial idea. Now, what did we do in linear regression? If you recollect, we discussed about ordinary least squares. That is what linear regression is or does. But what we are about to do is maximum likelihood estimation. What exactly is maximum likelihood estimation? Is It is a method which helps you to estimate the parameters and what, what is exactly it is, it's like a mathematical concept where uh, the 
where you're trying to estimate the distribution from which the parameters have might have come so let's say this is one distribution so the parameters must have come from this distribution so this is what exactly maximum likelihood estimation does why not ordinary least squares why maximum likelihood estimation we'll talk about it but this is what uh, on a very superficial level maximum likelihood estimation does joint probability mass function set of parameters can be used in a normal distribution based on maximum likelihood estimation the cost function of linear regression was very simple just the predicted value minus uh, predicted value minus the uh, the real value minus the predicted value whole square and that was the cost function of linear regression but what about what about uh, the max what about logistic regression we don't use that why why maximum likelihood estimation because that particular ideology y minus y cap leads to so this is linear regression right that was linear regression the line is linear so if line is linear it will always be differentiable but we are talking about single class multi class uh, binary class multi class classification the curve might be very zigzag so there are possibilities that you might be stuck up in a local optima if this is not uh, getting uh, to you don't get worried if you are able to understand please follow along if you're not nothing to worry about so let's say you are stuck up in a local optima there are very high possibilities that it might happen if we take the similar route as we have taken in the linear regression so what we do is use maximum likelihood estimation maximum likelihood estimation is a different approach we won't get into the mathematics but on a very superficial this is why we use maximum likelihood estimation uh, advantages of logistic regression does not require high computational power easy to implement interpret does not require scaling of features provides probability score of observation disadvantages if there are large number of statistical features very difficult vulnerable to overfitting and if independent variable has low correlation so how to remember these majority things we should remember is disadvantages because these are the cases you should have in mind that if your use case is matching with the disadvantages then you should not use logistic regression so if the independent variable if your independent variable has very low correlation with the target variable maybe logistic regression is not a good choice to proceed with try svm try xg boost try random forest classes why but not logistic regression right if you have a large number of categorical features within one variable so let's say you have ethnicity there might be multiple types of ethnicity so it's not preferred to use logistic regression right so kind of but let's say uh, these are not the cases and you have features uh, which scaling might in, uh, might be needed but how about taking a logistic regression it does not require scaling yes, if you do scaling it is always beneficial and it improves the performance but it's not mandatory like if you have to deal with knn scaling is must must so maths of logistic regression let's begin so this is something you would always observe if we talk about logistic regression what is this p p is something we call as odds ratio so p is something we call as odds ratio and you must have seen this as well this is our good old friend sigmoid what is sigmoid 1 by 1 plus it is one minus x the very starting point of deep learning so if you are deep learning so i'll be taking up deep learning with images then also i'll be discussing sigmoid uh but this is this is the very starting point of sigmoid or those kind of things so now we have this logistic function this is this and yep so let's try to understand how do we get to the desired output so here p is not the probability but rather we describe p as the odds ratio or rather to obtain the formula we describe it as log of odds ratio and if you do log of odds ratio what it would be at the base e so it is p by 1 minus p equal to e to the bar beta remove in the log if i remove the log so it would be beta plus beta 1x after solving you get p equal to 
is over beta naught plus beta one x divided by one plus uh, it is one beta naught plus beta one x. Simple mathematics, just just the assumption. So you have y equal to b naught plus b one x, right? In linear regression, this is something we all agree. But what if y is anything, right? Y can be anything. It can be z, it can be q, it can be r. But let's say I don't name. I assume that the y, whatever the y is, is my log of odds ratio. Y, what is log? What is odds ratio? Just ignore it for a while. But just remember the word. It is log of odds ratio. Log logarithm of odds ratio. What is odds ratio? What is logarithm? Just throw it out of mind. Whatever it is. Logarithm of odds ratio is log of p by one minus p and equals to our good old friend of linear regression, and thereby we get to the formula of logistic regression. If you divide by e by, uh, if you divide it by e to the power beta naught plus beta one x uh, in the numerator and denominator, you get the formula of uh, one by one plus e to the power minus beta naught plus beta one x. Which is a sigmoidal function. So let's proceed to the next slide. The next factor is understanding the cost function. This is pretty much asked in interviews or anything. You might be asked about cost function, which is log loss, logarithmic loss. And the reason why we use log loss and not the one which we saw in linear regression. The one which we saw in linear regression was. Was 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 this one? So we saw in linear regression, simple h theta i minus y i whole square half. So this is not what we are using. This is pretty dif different. But ideally, we should have used that only. No, we are dealing with probabilities this time. And if you are dealing with probabilities, you assume the distribution to have come with maximum likelihood estimation. Although we could have transformed the uh, I mean, this might be sounding very counterintuitive. Like at one point, I am saying that yes, linear regression line, just transform it to logistic regression. Then why not uh, just take the estimated probability? Let's say the probability would have been 0.8, but I said the probability is 0.6. I can just take the difference and square it up and those kind of thing. No, that is uh, you can't take the difference of probabilities and square it up. That doesn't make any sense, right? So that's why. You need to deal it with in a different manner. That this is uh, this works if you have let's say estimated price is six eight hundred, and predicted price uh, real price is eight hundred, predicted price is six hundred. Then you take the difference, square it up, and take the average of all such errors. But we are not dealing with we are dealing with the errors of probabilities. How do we deal with errors of probabilities? First, we need to have a mechanism to deal with errors of probabilities, and the uh, it's not maximum likelihood and then cost function. It is like more of cost function than max, maximum likelihood estimation. So this is the cost function. Don't get into the derivation. Just remember it. If you have time, if you have the energy, just try to Google and search about cost function or the cost estimation. Log loss, you get a lot of stuff, lot, lot of stuff. But this is what it is. So you have yi is the predicted and then log of yi and take the one minus. So it's p or another common form, p log p and plus one minus p log 1 minus p good enough and uh, all the all the points summation of all the points from 1 to n and average it out by dividing by n this is the log function now this is also a way we had discussed cost function versus error cost function versus error this is the plot we discussed and this is this is something we did spend our time on but something which might be asked is what if y equal to 1 and what if y equal to 0 so what if y equal to 1 Let's uh, substitute y equal to one. So this whole parameter gets zeroed up, and you have all the y log y parameters. So if you have y log y parameters, uh, this is pretty much it. You can just plot out all the values for x equal to zero, um, for x theta approaching zero. The cost would be uh, negative. So if it is log of zero, is usually and infinite number, so it's basically negative, those kind of things. And if the other way around, if y equal to zero, y equal to zero, you have this term as removed. You have one minus y log of one minus y. 
So if h theta is approaching one, if h theta is approaching one, then you have if h this to make this approach infinity. How can this approach infinity? What's the curve of log? This is logarithmic curve, right? This is the logarithmic curve. How does log approach infinity when it is approaching zero? Um, so this is the curve of logarithm. Logarithm. This is the curve of logarithm. Uh, what is log? Uh, when does log reach value of zero? Let's say we are taking at the base um, one. Log one is always zero, and log zero is infinity minus infinity. And anything above log one, anything above log one is positive. So this is the curve of log. If I want to make it reach infinity, I need to have the value of log. The anything the function functional value of log as zero. So if y equal to zero, then we have a different kind of curve, and if y equal to one, we have a different kind of curve. Those are these two curves. If I hope this is clear. If not, don't worry about it. Just uh, fiddle with the values, and you will be better off with it. So again, a bit of mathematics, but now i won't be solving up i'll have the snippets in front of you which are pretty much solved and so we'll be discussing what what's next we'll be discussing how to obtain the predictions different kind of predictions and what do they mean and signify plus we'll be discussing about how to understand the confusion matrices and these three parameters which are pretty much used sigmoid function is something we already discussed but always remember this thing this is usually asked in questions and competitions for sigmoid for tanh and there's one more activation function which i don't remember but uh, these are pretty much usually asked and then you have understanding the slopes we'll discuss about the logistic regression and the solver methods then we finally wrap up with regularization so this is the next uh, next 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 40 minutes Uh, we are pretty much on schedule, so let's begin. Oh, so obtaining predictions in logistic regression, obtaining predictions. How do you obtain predictions? And so this is something we discussed that this is log of odds, the entire linear regression thing. So this is this is and this is hereby we obtain the calculations. I just solved this in front of you. No need to worry about it. So what is logit? Logit function is log of odds ratio that is logit a short 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 name logit log of just remove the ink ln of pi pi 1 minus pi now what is pi by 1 minus pi this is known as odds ratio what is odds ratio we'll discuss now there are two types of curve of course we have discussed about this this is your s shaped curve for this happens for linear functions if there's a polynomial function then you have bell shaped curve where we have x we have pi and it happens like this so this is what it is uh, yeah let's discuss odds ratio what is odds ratio is a very math mathematical term odds ratio uh usually this Cursed in terms of let's see, you have a probability value of 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.7 of getting the deal. So I would ask what what are the odds in favor or odds in uh, those. So usually first we start with odds ratio, and odds ratio is the ratio of success, which is 0 0.7, upon ratio of failure, which is 0 0.3. Now success can be anything. Success can be failure as well. Don't get by this term. Just success is the thing which you are concerned with. It might be a negative thing as well. So let's say success of uh, success of um, going down. Uh, uh, let's say success or uh, success might be the stock price going down of any X Y Z stock. So that is not a success, but that is something the matter of concern. So that is a better word. Probability of success is something the something which we are concerned about, or something which whose probability value with we are dealing with. 
So that is how the odds ratio is calculated. And this is what we call as odds ratio. If you want to know about the probabilities, the probabilities would have been obtained once we had solved this equation of log of odds ratio equals to beta 1 plus beta naught plus beta 1 x. If you had solved this equation in terms of p, you would have obtained probabilities. Now let's see what we do exactly. If there is a threshold of 0 0.5, if there is a threshold of 0 0.5, you draw an imaginary line. Anything which is greater than or equal to 0 0.5 will be projected upwards and thereby will be termed as label one. Anything below it would be projected below. And once you project it below, it would be labeled as zero. Good enough. And then we have this S curve where we say that um, the Y values lie within the range of zero to one. Something which the, this, this pretty much explains. Odds ratio and log odds ratio, I think this must be clear by now. This is the odds ratio. This is the log of ratio. This is the probability value. Now, once you have obtained your classification results, so these are the things you would be dealing with stats models, not a scalar. No, 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 no. These are something you will be dealing in stats models. So if you have time and if you want to put the theory well, you can start experimenting with stats model, but I wouldn't suggest directly jumping into stats model. If you have a good understanding and hold of SKLearn's uh, logistic regression, then it's a good way to go. It's stats model. And yeah, so these kind of things are usually generated there. So let me share something. Let's say um, I, I'll show the ordinary least square methods. No, 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 the logic method, logic method of stats model which generates such kind of report. And that would be pretty interesting. Any questions still here? We are going to proceed to the next half of the discussion. Any questions? Oh, uh, in the multi-class case, why we divide, why we build multiple binary, we build multiple, yes, it is one versus many case, right? Sorry, didn't get it, why we divide by one minus P, it is just the formula, you see, and it's like the log of odds ratio is P is success, one minus P is failure, and log of odds is something we, odds ratio is a standard mathematical definition, and for Logistic regression, we try to find log of odds ratio, log its probability of success. Uh, yes. So I'm assuming that everyone is following along and we can proceed. So next part of the lecture is a bit more about understanding what the results are. So let me keep this open here and this here. If I click F5 now. Yeah, pretty good. I'll be able to get your messages. So, Uh, this is something you must have seen and you must will be definitely asked about interpreting these kind of things. So there are four combinations. So it is made by classical confusion matrix. Two by two is pretty simple, but let's discuss three by three. And let's discuss three by three. So what is how to the best way to remember this? The way I remember this. <laughs> so the best way to remember this is the way I remember this. And this is two a uh, combination of true false and positive negative so if you combine true with positive and if you combine false with positive so first you need to understand what is positive negative and then you need to understand that it is whether or not it's true or not positive and this part of the 
prediction, this part is what we, what I call as. So this is nowhere. Please listen very carefully. If you listen, you will always remember for the rest of your life. I have never ever forgotten this thing because this was pretty good. This part is for outcome predicted by the model. And this part is for the adjective. It describes whether or not the outcome predicted by the model is true or false. You get it? So what would be true positive? Model predicted, read it from right and go to left. The model predicted it positive, but it and it was actually positive. So what does false positive mean? Model predicted it positive and it was not positive. It was not positive. So it goes for negative. Model predicted it negative and it was actually negative. And for false negative, it is model predicted it negative and it was not negative. This happens not in general, but for a class. So for every class, for each, for each class. Let's not write with mouse till I get a good writing pad. Yeah, but it's comprehensible. Yeah, so I mean, for Apple, you'll have a different value for true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative. So is the case for orange, so is the case for mango. So now let's solve it together, right? Uh, if time permits, how much time is left? We have, uh, I mean, let's, let's take it. Let's get it done. Uh, this is not actually lost to evaluation. This is me talking about evaluation metrics. There's a playlist of mine on my YouTube channel. That is metrics evaluation. I have discussed all the metrics in very detailed manner. If you have time and energy and uh, devote some time to it, you will have a greater understanding and good depth of it. So let's concern, let's talk about Apple. Now Apple's true positive would be, I predicted it Apple and it was actually Apple. So such samples for Apple, not for everybody is seven. True negative for Apple would be, I predicted it not Apple and those were also not actually Apple. So this lot, this lot, this lot, is too negative for Apple. I predicted Apple, but it was uh, actually orange and mango. So I was predicting it. Is it positive or negative? Doesn't matter. Anything which is under concern is positive, right? Anything which is not under concern is negative. I just told you a moment ago in log odds ratio, right? If you remember. So anything which is under concern is positive. Under concern at this moment is Apple. Apple is neither positive nor negative, but it is under concern. That is why I would consider it positive. So I predicted it positive. I predicted it Apple, but it was not actually Apple. So those samples are these. What are these? Predicted positive predicted positive, but were not positive. So false positive of whom? Of Apple. Well, I predicted it not Apple or negative. However, however, these were actually apples. So I made a false negative. Any confusion in this? Any confusion in this? No. Let's move on. So assuming that you have a good clarity and have the ability to calculate two positive, false, two negative, false, positive, false, negative, you will be asked, you will be more concerned with calculating accuracy, sensitivity, specificity. But what you would be more interested in knowing the essence of it because that is nowhere discussed. And I am discussing the everything you have, must have observed that I usually take up the things which are not discussed. Because things which have discussed are easily available are something you must be already knowing. So what is accuracy? What is sensitivity? And what is specificity? 
is more of a concern to me but yes you must remember the formulas for your exam point of view interview point of view anything but when to use it it means the number of correct identifications for each class so you have true positives by true negative for each class if you have three classes apple banana orange apple mango orange you need to calculate the true positives and true negatives so it is accuracy for apple then you have to, let's say you have to calculate overall accuracy how do you calculate overall accuracy you calculate accuracy for apple accuracy for mango accuracy for orange then you average it out but let's say accuracy of apple would be true positives of apple plus true negatives of apple by true positive of apple plus false positive of apple plus true negative of apple plus false negative of apple this is what accuracy is mathematically but what does it mean it means that you need to take the true positives of uh, you need to take the true positive values of apples the ones which were actually apples and predicted as apples and the ones which were not apples and were predicted as apples and that is what we call as accuracy where does it fail let's say there is a highly imbalanced data set where 99% of the data set is you are detecting whether the client will customer would click on a link or you are predicting whether or not there is a chance of fraud so 99% of the chances are that customer would not click on the ads which are being showed or 99% of the chances are that there would not be any fraud case so if you just simply make a python code which does if uh, return false that would be a 99% scoring model but that is not we are looking for we are more concerned at 1% so those are not the good cases where you should be using accuracy accuracy should be used where the data set is perfectly or nearly perfectly balanced now let's discuss about sensitivity what is sensitivity used to quantify the correctly identified positives yes right my good absolutely right so is used to quantify the basically just get to the formula you have true positives what does true positive mean true positive means that um the correct uh, the predictions which were made let's say the we predicted apple and it was actually apple divided by we predicted apple were actually predicted apple and we predicted it as not apple and the prediction was not correct which means those were also apple or those are something we were concerned of so let's say i am more concerned of apples or i am more concerned of fraud cases then i would be talk about i would be more interested in talking about sensitivity getting my point now specificity talks about the other way around it talks about the negative cases so let's say uh, not apple the cases which were not apple i and were actually correct predictions i say them as true negative so is the case with false positives i call them as apple but were not actually apple so they were also not apples the amount of not apples predicted correctly or identified correctly is specificity and that's it so point function we already discussed comparing the slopes so this is your standard good old friend 1 by 1 plus e to the power minus x then you have if you double the slope it becomes steeper if you add a constant it shifts right if you add plus a simple mathematical concept plus means right to the origin minus means left to the origin good enough now we are here for the scalar and logistic regression we'll discuss it in a while and then we have regularization and we'll wrap up the session yep we are running good just a sec so let's open this particular thing scalar and logistic regression I think now we are well prepared to talk about logistic regression. So these are a bunch of default parameters you should be knowing, and let's now let's talk about the documentation and what it has to offer. 
there are also these kind of things you must check it out the examples using logistic regression these are pretty much good examples of logistic regression where they talk about how to use logistic regression plotting logistic regression sometimes you might be interesting so i'm not able to discuss a lot of things but this is pretty much i mean sklearn's examples are very badly organized but if somebody takes the pain to organize this it's a very go to good tutorial point i mean a very good starter point if you have the energy to go through each and every notebook a lot of lot of information is being provided at a single place all right now we have this what are the default terms we have penalty as l2 we have dual as false to to all equal to 0.001 c equal to 1 doesn't make any sense let's read the description so logistic regression logic max and if you have watched my slides very carefully this particular line the first slide was stolen from here or taken from here so this is the slide number 1 which was the open slide uh this one this particular line was taken from here now in multi class cases which it handles automatically the sklearn's logistic regression it handles automatically the multi class cases the idea for this is one versus rest thing which is done by as mentioned by uh, mr perry and uh, this is how it is done one versus the scheme so the multi class option is sent to ovr and um and uses the cross entropy laws if the multi class option is sent to what is cross entropy laws what is by uh, what is uh, this binary cross entropy laws the multi class cross entropy laws this is something of uh, which i'll discuss in much more detail in neural uh, neural networks for images i think that is a better place to discuss this uh then we have this this class implements regularized logistic regression using the lib linear library newton cg sag saga lb fgs solvers note that the regularization is applied by default it can handle both tens and sparse inputs the c ordered arrays or csr matrices containing 64 bits for optimal performance in those kind of things uh neither did i understand it very well so let it be the newton cg sag lg so, uh, solvers we'll discuss about solvers support only l2 regularization with primal formulation and no regularization the lib linear solver supports both regularization so it's talking about uh if you select if you select solver what kind of regularization you can adopt to and we have a good summary table for this which i got from internet and yeah let's discuss the parameters what is penalty so we have not discussed this let's discuss this sorry didn't i I remember precision recall F one recall and sensitivity are the same, but I'm not sure how or whether they say that. Yes, recall and sensitivity are same, but not in the case of specificity. These are different different terms which are used. There are multiple terms. We have F one score, we have recall, we have sensitivity, we have specificity, we have precision, and then we have. Uh, so there are F one beta. There's multiple their balanced accuracy score there's uh, multiple multiple metrics so it ultimately boils down to what we are concerned about and they, these are just a bunch of i just wanted to explain the way to interpret how what this these particular metrics are about so let's first talk about this regularization So regularization shifts or shifts your model towards the bias side of the things. So what is regularization? If any time you find your model to be overfitting, your natural instinct would be to perform regularization. And regularization makes for a more generalizable model. 
how does it does so if a model is overfitting that means it has high variance if your model is underfitting it has low bias it is it has low bias or it has high uh, low variance or high bias do you understand bias versus variance if not check out my youtube channel there's a playlist metrics evaluation bias versus variance pretty much explained now l1 regularization arts these are how do you how do you penalize or how do you increase the uh how if it is learning every data point so what is overfitting let's say if one is the harmonic mean of this yes yes what uh what is it what is harmonic mean harmonic mean is um pretty much that 2 by 1 uh, 1 by f 1 by precision 1 by recall that is pretty much harmonic mean 2 divided by 2 divided by 1 by x plus 1 by y so what is average average is x x plus y by 2 geometric mean is x into y raised to the power 1 by 2 and harmonic mean is 2 divided by 1 by x plus 1 by y so this is what is harmonic mean now replace x with precision y with recall so it would be 2 pr by 1 plus uh, 2 pr by p plus r this is what f1 score is so it is basically harmonic mean why harmonic mean of precision recall because precision and recall are pretty much against each other So you might have very high precision, but it's not possible to have simultaneously a very high recall. If you are concerned about both the values, you should use F1. If you are very much concerned with the precision, what is precision? Two positive by two positive by false positive. If you are concerned with the two false identification of the, uh, this is a very very different. We are going off topic. Just just uh, refer to my refer to my playlist. We just fifteen minutes left. Refer to my playlist. Now we are getting off topic. Uh, pretty pretty much explained over there. Uh, this is this is regularization shifts your model. So what we are what we are talking about? We are talking about regularization. Regularization is something which tries to remove the overfitting. How do you remove the overfitting? You are you have a model and model is trying to plot. It's a fit itself to every and each other point. What do you do? You just you know, ask it not to fit to each other point and just make a simple go through it. If that is what it is, then we have talk about regularization. And yes, so this is what it is. So we are trying to add a penalty or penalize the regularization. If penalty is to be added. And that is the degree one penalty. We call it as L one regularization. If degree two, we have L two regularization. Usually, L two works better for logistic regression. In depth video, uh, just I can share, but pretty much on a very superficial level, this is what it is. L one does with some feature selections. L two does. L two does. Uh, L one does. I think it does with dropping of some features. I don't exactly remember. Just check it out. One does drops of features. One does. or uh, reduces the values of features then we have solvers so this is solver we have multiple solver options so i'll be discussing this is the particular call line of the class method logistic regression you have penalty parameter you have dual you have toll you have c you have fit into uh, sep you have intercept scaling class weight random state solver max iterations multi class verbose form start and jobs l1 ratio multiple parameters i will be discussing the ones you should be supplied with at this moment at this point and the ones which are usually mostly dealt with so what is solver solver is the one which does the solving and there are four kind of solvers so one is newton cg method classical newton method not good for large data set this is the default solver lbfgs or the very full form is Limited memory, Broyden, Fletcher, Goldfarb, Shannon, Sol Solver. Approximate using the second 
derivative matrix i don't know what it does exactly this is on a very superficial level if you are asked somewhere or you must know on a very superficial level lib linear is a very very popular alternative for lbfgs lib linear does for very large data set classification and coordinate descent algorithm coordinate descent is based on minimizing a variation function then you have sag and saga sag is stochastic uh stochastic something stochastic gradient descent some of those kind of things and this is a summary of it so if you have lib linear it won't be doing this one versus it would have one versus rest i think everybody has one versus rest l2 penalty so is everybody has uh not everybody has one versus rest l1 penalty is only supported by lib linear versus saga and faster for large data set is sag sag and saga and then you have robust to unscaled is for c ones and then you have penalize the intercept which is a bad thing is done by lib linear elastic net is something which we call as l1 plus l2 penalty both combined and that is done by saga so these are multiple options these are if you are trying to hyper tune the parameters this, these are those now let's discuss the parameters you have multi class you have multiple option you either you can go from one versus rest or you can talk about multinomial what these are you can search about it warm start is one thing l1 ratio is there if you are choosing the penalty as elastic net or something which is a combination of l1 penalty and l2 penalty max iteration is the number of since we are doing gradient descent we are not using the statistical methods we are doing a gradient descent and we are trying to estimate the parameters using the gradient descent number of iterations you want solver we have discussed solver random state is used to have a reproducible result as you did and trained the model for one set of data at a random state of 2022 so anybody with the same parameters values and the same data set having set the random state as 2022 will always and always receive the same output values of the accuracy and those kind of scores now we have c c is an important factor c is the smaller the value of regularization small values means a large regularization so if it is basically inverse of regularization strength or how much regularization you want to add so initially we have one but you can uh, decrease the uh, decrease it to 0.1 0.5 and it would have a greater regularization or greater penalization or less overfitting in case your model is overfitting then only increase the decrease the regularization if your model is overfitting then decrease the c value if not don't mess around with the c value and these are big things penalty we discussed l1 penalty l2 penalty can we apply statistical ml in this case i think we can apply i don't exactly know but it is majorly the thing which stats models does logit in stats models but i'm not sure about scalar because mle is something which is implemented behind the scenes by loss derivation this thing but how can we implement i don't know i have not actually done with that experiment with it and yeah pretty much it thank you that's it uh, that wraps up today's session i was actually planning to discuss code but then i realized discussing code would let me cut and shorten up the theory part and that is something i didn't want to happen so let's let it be i'll share with mr perry the github repo i which i plan to make for both these sessions and i'll share the github repo with data set you can experiment out with the jupyter notebook or all those kind of things any questions there's have questions just open your mouth uh, open your mic and just jump in Yes, feel free to unmute everybody, and um, now is a good time to ask questions. So, um, I had a question about the the multi-class case. Um, the way I remember it um, is that you actually end up building uh, a a number of different binary classifiers um, to handle multi-classes. Uh, yes, 
it is usually one versus s number of multi binary classifiers to deal with multi class okay i imagine s taylor and heights heights that aspect of it for you uh, sorry what is it okay. so when i studied log logistic regression i remember in the multi class case uh, we were told that you have to train a number of different binary classifiers um, yes, in theory, in theory, uh, in theory, just and just just what I discuss is it. In theory, we always have a bunch of multiple binary classifiers which are based on, like, uh, theoretically, is always zero versus one. Right. But in in the scalar, they try to implement it for us for multi class classification as well. So in scalar, it works as everything which is not the class. So we have apple, mango, orange. Apple is class one and everything is class zero. Now same will happen for mango, same will happen for orange. So this is something on a very superficial level I know about dealing of multi-class classification for by the logistic regression. Right. Yeah, ordinary least square method is something we just discussed that ordinary least square method is a method which is good for predicting a uh, linear method like what, what what was ordinary least square methods we were taking the difference of the predicted versus the real and then derivative making the derivative of it with the respect of the parameters right that was ordinary least square method so that has an one underlying assumption that the curve is linear now we don't have a linear curve over here it is not a linear curve so if you don't have a linear curve what might actually happen is uh, there might be multiple con uh, such it it will be a convex curve where there might be multiple minimas. If there are multiple minimas, what might happen is it might stuck into a local minima. If it gets stuck into a local minima and those kind of things happen, so and curve is not predicted using these kind of things, not in these square methods. So the be better method out is to use maximum likelihood estimation, which tries to estimate where the data distribution might have come from. Ordinary least square method, at least from my own understanding, we cannot solve using ordinary least square method. Uh, reason being, uh, reason being that or OLS is used uh, is based on the fundamentally based on the assumption that the curve is linear and is different uh, is not even differentiable is a linearly linear line and for a linear line OLS is there. It's a non-linear curve might get stuck into a local optim uh, local minima. If you don't want to get stuck into a local minima, the best way out is use maximum likelihood estimation. OLX can give negative probability values. OLS can, OLS is a method to find the parameters as per my understanding. So it's nothing with probabilities and those kind of things. So we're just trying to estimate the parameters and parameter estimation is done by OLS or MLE. Once you have the parameters, then you can make the predictions using the parameters. No, it is the S kind of line. The S is not linear, it's an exponential thing. It's a, not a linear thing which separates the class. In loss segregation, we discussed the sigmoid kind of thing, the S-shaped curve. That is what separates the classes. The linear line is something which I asked you to remember as thresholding, the one which was passing from the midpoint. This was the linear line with a virtual imaginary line. You can set the threshold very higher. You can set the threshold very lower. So if you set the threshold very lower, the projections would be limited. Why can't we can't solve analytically the logistic regression? Yes, we can't solve analytically the logistic regression. It is usually an iterative approach based on gradient descent. Gradient descent we discussed. The reason being very, very much similar to can we use gradient descent to optimize? Yes, gradient descent is used to optimize. That is why we have a parameter as maximum iterations. So for how many iterations do you want the gradient descent to run?
Emily versus Katie Decent is something. Uh, Emily is the gradient descent is used to estimate the parameters and go get along with it. So gradient descent was also there in linear regression. So it's one of the methods. So gradient descent is an iterative method which tries to predict the parameters based on the values of the prediction. So if you have predictions, how far is from the ideal prediction or the cost, cost versus error curve, get the gradients of it, then update the parameters. That is what gradient descent does. Yes, sure, get to the email. You have my contacts. I think you must be having. Did I share anywhere? No, I did not share. So reach out to my email. It is, it is you can also ask questions in the deep learning group and and tag yeah, them. So available there. I am yeah. really available there. And email is fine. You can ask by email. You can, uh, if you can uh, want to directly contact on LinkedIn, you can contact on LinkedIn. What is any other social media that you prefer is fp.com slash employee channel. Apart from it, pretty much this. And the, the slides will be made available um, as well as the video. Yeah, uh, what is it? The slides in the video will be made available and I'll post that to the um, uh, the deep learning group. It's also, the links are also in the distribution emails I send out every week. Yeah, yeah. And feel free to contact me as well if you are, if you are, are unable to reach uh, and to reap or or any of the other presenters for that matter. Yeah, I wanted, I, I really wanted to share the code and do some live coding with you, but there's a hard crunch of time on me as well as on you guys. I mean, uh, it doesn't seem nice to unnecessarily extend the session. So let's Yeah, see. no, that, that's fine. Yeah. yeah, all right, all right. Okay, Um. does anybody else have any questions? Um, you can use actually you can use analytical methods you can definitely use analytical methods but the results are not guaranteed to reach a good i mean it might be that you might get stuck into a local optima that is what is uh, the prime concern you can definitely use the ones that we used ols ols can be used however you might get stuck into a local optima that is what i'm trying to say you can use this method rather than it does not have a closed form solution Closed form solution, or better to say, is like uh, there are chances that uh, there are chances that you might get stuck into a local optima. So that is something we are trying to avoid. The best way to do that is using a different approach, and that approach is maximum likelihood estimation. How that works, that's a very different ideology or concept. We can discuss that, and you add me to the group email that is. Uh, this is this one is for. Mr. Perry. So the, the maximum likelihood estimator is a different process. We can discuss that. If you want, we can discuss that in the next session as that would be my last session. So we can definitely extend upon that. But very, very superficially, ordinary least words can be used for logistic regression. Do not use the statement anywhere in the interview. Logistic, ordinary least words I, the reason I'm avoiding this, this statement is valid. Ordinary least squares can be used in logistic regression. The only thing is you'll have a very, very, very bad logistic model because it would be stuck somewhere in the local optima. To avoid that, we use um, anyone I thought of, anyone. I usually used to uh, share, so I'll get back to it. So, you have ordinary least square. So the reason is you can use that, but it's very, very possible that you might get stuck to a local optima, and that is something you must be you must avoid. And that is avoided by use of maximum likelihood estimator. How maximum likelihood estimator works with the help of gradient descent. Gradient descent I already explained. What is maximum likelihood estimation is something I did not explain, and that is what's causing the confusion. Don't get into it. I'll discuss maximum likelihood estimation 
in my on my in my session of neural network for images if time permits i'll discuss as don't don't unnecessarily get into it just understand what maximum likelihood estimation on a very superficial level is you have a bunch of data points and so what neural network for images is neural network for images is we are trying neural network for images is not trying to understand image it is trying to understand the data so that is also kind of maximum likelihood estimation but not exactly but we do use gradient descent and anywhere we use gradient descent is the place where we are trying to understand the underlying underlying data distribution if you're trying to understand the underlying data distribution you are using uh, you're just trying to understand what the data distribution is and so is this case we're trying to understand the underlying data distribution and this particular by experiment so this is not by any logic usually how what is science so this is a very fundamental question what exactly is science science is running multiple random experiments getting a result which matches and then claiming it and explaining it very logically but while you reach that how you the how that particular guy reached that experiment is entirely hidden trial so this is what science is science is everything like hidden trial if that hidden trial matches up with your assumptions then you start explaining it logically but actually there's no logic i mean there's logic but how did you reach no logic is yeah Exper experimentation yeah it's pretty much experimentation yeah there's a there's a famous quote that says um research is what i'm doing when i don't know what i'm doing <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, pretty much. I mean, the, that's the beauty of science. Uh, you do not know what you're doing, but I mean, just random experiments, then we start explaining the things and we make logics. And if somebody doesn't understand the logic, we say you don't have a logical understanding. I mean, this is pretty much experimental. A right. bunch of experiments which became successful and then those people started explaining the random hit and trials. Pretty much science. Yeah. yeah it's All interesting right. because... um. Artificial intelligence started out very much um, as um, uh, something that people really tried to formalize, and it's really shifted over into kind of more of the science mentality of experimentation. Yeah, I mean, having some industry standard practices is good. Like these yeah. are industry-wide practices. Those are different thing, but there's usually a lot of experimentation which is there. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess um, if you can, uh, you can stop sharing your screen now. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay, well, I'd like to thank everybody for participating. Um, I'm glad we had more questions this time. It's, uh, it's actually very good to, to do it right after the, the talk. Um, next week, we're going to be covering chapter 12, which is generalized linear models. Um, the author actually marked it as an optional chapter in the book, but um, uh, I think that's for people using it as a textbook. I mean, in, in either case, we're planning on, on covering it, and that's what we'll be doing next week. And then after that, we'll be jumping into um, the section that I'm really excited about, which is uh, neural networks, and which actually has relates more to deep learning. I feel like all the material we've been covering so far is kind of building up to that. So. So uh, once again, thank you very much, and Tariq, that was a very informative uh, presentation. And um, uh, are you going to separate your slides, or do you want to just send me the whole the whole thing as a PDF? I mean, I, I have a link, so I can just save it as a PDF. Yes, but, um, as, okay, as I'll just you... I'll just leave it uh, combined, so it'll probably be more logical. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah, I think that would uh, I think that is up to your discretion how you. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll entirely up to you. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, thanks again, everybody. And uh, we'll see you here next week. Have a good night or a, a good day, depending on your time zone. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.